In the first James Bond film, Dr. No, there comes a moment when the audience knows undeniably that the world of 007 is a world unlike any other. This was the first of many imaginative, stylized sets designed by one of the cinema's greatest visual artists, Ken Adam. Ken Adam, the production designer, was very much a key element in what became the success of James Bond, i.e. the opulence, the size, the importance of the sets. One of the great uh, designers of all time. Ken is a brilliant production designer. He's a genius. And I don't use that word lightly. I think Ken is probably one of the people, one of the foremost people who are actually responsible for the success of the Bond films. Ken Adams' contribution is immense to all the Bond movies. Ken Adams' contribution is beyond, <laughs> beyond description. I left Germany at, at the age of 13 in 1934 uh, because of Hitler and uh, then came to England. Ken was the, or is, the only German that flew, flew for the RAF during World War II. And eventually got my uh, younger brother to join me, uh, join my wing uh, just before the end of the war. But he was a real hero because he, unlike his brother, who'd become naturalized because he went into British intelligence. Ken never was naturalized, and so he was serving in the Air Force, but he was still a German. So if he had been shot down and captured, he'd have been executed as a traitor. After leaving the RAF in 1946, I had about an eight-month period out of work and then started at Riverside Studios as a junior draftsman on a film. Within 10 years, Adam becomes recognized as one of Europe's best film designers. He's soon hired by producer Albert R. Cubby Broccoli. I did the trials of Oscar Wilde for Cubby, which was a great artistic success. Harry Saltzman I met in Italy on some of the films I worked in Italy. So when Harry and Cubby decided to do Dr. No, they both asked for me to design it. I was fortunate in as much as both of them knew me and knew my work. So Cubby sent me Dr. No. I really think Ken Adams' sets, when they went back to England and they made these unbelievable sets, I think that's what brought it up from sort of being a kind of low budgety, okay film to being something really special. I contacted all the uh, heads of departments at Pinewood Studio and asked them to come up with new materials, not the old film construction materials. And they were very encouraging, and because they were very encouraging and supportive, I then started designing sets, imaginative sets, which otherwise, if I wouldn't have had that backup, I probably wouldn't have done. This, you can only call it tongue in the cheek, slightly ahead of its time type of concept. One felt the public wanted to see as much of Ursula Andrus and Sean in various stages of undress. Again, trying to keep it simple, but sexy. Even the simplest sets require imaginative thinking. It was a small set, but I think it was very effective. I did it all out of like a gunmetal set. And then I inclined the walls in. Other sets call for expert advice. None of us had any ideas, certainly not in 1962, what a nuclear water reactor looked like. So I managed to talk to uh, some scientists at Harwell. And after giving me uh, advice on this or that, they said that that's what a nuclear water reactor looks like. When it comes time to do the next 007 film, From Russia With Love, Ken Adam is busy on another project, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove. What about that trick pool time? But Adam returns for Goldfinger. One of Adam's assistants on the film is Peter Lamont. 
Ken's art director, Peter Merton, called me one day and said, look, we're going to do a James Bond uh, film called Goldfinger. Would you be interested in coming to do drafting for us? When he started with me uh, on, on Goldfinger, I think both he and his brother Michael, they were two young uh, draftsmen. So I bowled up on the first morning and uh, got my drawing board set up. Ken came in and he said, well, I don't know you, but uh, I'd like you to do this. And he gave me four blocks, the exterior. The film provides a sterling showcase for Ken Adams' work. From Goldfinger's rumpus room... The gold depository at Fort Knox, gentlemen. ...to the laser room... And members of your curious profession are few in number. ...to the interior of Fort Knox itself. I was, of course, overwhelmed by the great Ken Adams set of Fort Knox. I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, and it's marvelous to work in a set like that. It gives you another dimension to, to, to what you feel. You can't easily say that if it had been somebody else and not Ken Adam, uh, it would have been unique. It's his vision that really created the world in which Bond lives. Thunderball poses a challenge of a different sort, designing watercraft. I was so fortunate on all the Bond films, starting with Johnny Stairs, who was a brilliant engineer. You'd sketch them first and say, what do you think about this, Johnny? Can we do this? Can you do it? You know, what are the problems? Can you see problems in this? The thing about what his ability that, that struck me the most was being able to look at a piece of paper and turn it into reality. If somebody comes up with a uh, nuclear bomb carrier, and much to my surprise, Jordan Klein in Miami, Florida, he said, Ken, that's fine. I said, don't tell me you can accept this design. He said, we'll make it work. And that always happens on the bonds, much to my amazement. I never forget the biggest nightmare for everybody was at Disco Volante. They found this old um, uh, hydrofoil. I came up with a design to increase the length of the hydrofoil by building like a catamaran around the back of it to make it look like a bigger yacht. Jack Manson built, built in Allied Marine this cocoon. Jettison cocoon. Thunderball also features another eye-popping Ken Adams set, Spectre Headquarters. Like Goldfinger's rumpus room before it, it's an animated set. The shattering success of Thunderball allows Ken Adam to give his imagination free reign with the next Bond film, You Only Live Twice. It was almost the cartoon effect, I call it, because your sets were just so jaw-dropping, and they got more sophisticated and more elegant, and they added a, a depth of sinister to the, the baddie. If you take a look at, say, the, the, the mountain on You Only Live Twice, it was... Where else would Blofeld have lived? We hadn't found the locations that Fleming had talked about, so somebody came up with the idea, wouldn't it be fun if we had the villain inside that extinct crater? He would settle down and he'd produce the most amazing drawings. I came up with a scribble about that size. He didn't worry too much about the cost. I could see it more or less three-dimensionally, but I also knew that it had to be gigantic. This, of course, he was the perfect man for. The dimensions were unbelievable. I mean, the long shot was 450 feet. There, I thought, you really did have a genius. The Las Vegas locale of Diamonds Are Forever showcases another spectacular setting for Blofeld. What appealed to me there was that the Willard White character was loosely based on a friend of Covey's who was Howard Hughes. And it gave me an opportunity to design his penthouse in Las Vegas, how I felt it should be. Adam also has to design a suite for 007. The water bay became the central part of the suite. And I thought it would be nice to see the fish swimming around in the water bay. Well, that's easier said than done. And in fact, it became a gigantic problem because I had to design like plexiglass aquariums all around the water bed in which the fish were swimming and the weight was unbelievable. Of course, no Bond film is complete without a laboratory. Now will you get out of here? Certainly, Doctor. I've seen everything I need to see. Or out of the ordinary vehicles. 
Get him off that machine. That isn't a toy. Now, we had a lot of problems with that because I tried to use the actual wheels for this moon buggy, and they kept breaking, and the suspension kept breaking until we finally got it right. Adam is absent from the next two Bond films, Live and Let Die and The Man with the Golden Gun. After winning an Academy Award for his work on Barry Lyndon, Adam returns to the world of 007 with The Spy Who Loved Me. I remember the first scene in The Spy Who Loved Me of Gogol's office. Very simple, but incredibly effective. I wanted to go big with Gogol's office, as opposed to M's office. I wanted to do it the opposite well. I was inspired by Eisenstein, and I designed a sort of crypt-like structure of a Russian Orthodox cathedral or church. I knew when I had that idea, it was a good idea. I always feel one chair or one painting or one something can give more of a message to the audience than by overdressing it. I thought it was fun to set uh, M's uh, office in one of the tombs. It wasn't a difficult set to design, but a difficult set to paint, fresco painting. A normal studio painter would not know how to deal with it, whereas a scenic painter who has worked for theatre and opera is more capable of doing it. And that was half the secret, to make all those frescoes look believable. Once again, Adam is faced with designing a villain's headquarters in an unusual location. I was experimenting with new shapes. The style of a bomb movie has got to look great. It's no good coming into a room and somebody opening a, a book and handing an atlas to somebody. No, you have to come in. Somebody has to press a button. Half the wall has to spread apart. Thousands of screens have to light up. And Ken does that absolutely magnificently. The major problem was for the plasterers at Pinewood because it was a curved set. It had a curve ceiling. We sent a second unit to Okinawa to get all the footage of interesting looking fish for the various sort of portals and Stromberg's apartment. I wish to conduct my life on my own terms and in surroundings with which I can identify. The dining room I was a little scared about. I wanted to show the early Renaissance paintings and then surprise the audience by these paintings going up and revealing that this room is underwater. They were megalomaniacs, but why shouldn't they have a Picasso or a, or a Rembrandt or whatever? Everything was real in his sets. I mean, if, if it was timber, he got mahogany and, and always very expensive. We're going to blow this lot up. Yeah, everything gets blown up in Bond, which is rather sad. Adam also creates the shark pool, where Stromberg dispatches those who displease him. And I came up with that sort of gun-like structure of being catapulted into the shark tank. The highlight of The Spy Who Loved Me is one of Adam's most ambitious 007 sets, the interior of Stromberg's supertanker. Certainly the supertanker set was one of the biggest interior sets ever done. At the time, there was no stage which would have served both as a tank and big enough to house three nuclear-powered submarines. How in the world can we do that? There's no stage in, in Europe that could uh, hold such a set. I came up with the idea of building the 007 stage, which ended up having three atomic submarines side by side in the stage. I designed the stage around the set and used really the structure as part of the set, which was a very exciting challenge. I did my sketch. The set was translated into models. He would stand in his office hour after hour just drawing these extraordinary drawings and they were always very grand big sets he drew all his sketches with uh, felt tip he had lots of different felt tips from black through to the palest gray we've done corridor after corridor after corridor 
And I came up with this shape and the suspended floor and two or three openings in the side of the corridor and the whole set was able to tilt. It is my favorite set. Nobody realized how much water was being catapulted into that set and the strength of that water. And Barbara was absolutely panicking. That's not acting, an actual look of extreme fear and panic on her face as she's hit by that avalanche of water. Strongberg has a custom-designed escape pod. It was almost like a miniature version of Atlantis somehow. Adam's designs for The Spy Who Loved Me earn him his third Academy Award nomination. I think it is the best Bond picture I've ever done. Next came Moonraker, a production so huge, one studio was not enough. There were three studios in Paris, and we took over every one of them. I also met some brilliant construction people in, in Paris, you know. The person who built that centrifuge was unbelievable. In fact, Derek was insanely jealous. He said, Ken, why do you have to build it full size? Let me build a model of it. I said, we're going to build it full size. We're always dry on a bond to give reality, so let's build it. Moonraker once again had the requisite laboratory. I loved that laboratory. Laboratories normally are tables with Bunsen burners and a lot of retorts and so on, and they're all dull, I find. So I came up with this idea of these cylindrical shapes in a famous Venetian uh, 15th century palace. Moonraker also requires more watercraft. I designed the boat with that hang glider built into the roof of the boat. It was always a challenge because you had to come up with a different idea for each of the Bond films. I did seven Bond films and each one created a new problem or a new challenge. With Moonraker, Adam met the challenge with an unusual variation on the villain's lair. I came up with this, what we call the Great Chamber. What I was trying to do was to create a transition set between the jungle in South America and the villain's lair. It was a costly set, it was a difficult set to put up. Uh, at the same time, I tried to get some of the Aztec culture in it, so I used Aztec sculpture and paintings on glass and so on. And that exhaust chamber was not an easy set to construct because it was on a curve, it was built partly in perspective, so all the elements had to reduce. Like many Ken Adams sets before it, this one was animated. The space station takes Ken Adams' designs to new heights. I had done some research with NASA. Ken Adams took those ideas and amplified them into a full-fledged Ken Adams space station. So I did my first sketches, and then in the art department, we built a little model of it. I had to use a lot of plastic materials for the cladding of the various elements. And um, we had to have big explosions in the set. When the explosion happened, the whole set caught fire. And even though we had six Paris fire engines standing by, they had to work all through the night to extinguish the fire. It was uh, certainly the biggest budget bond that I ever did. I think visually we gave them everything but the sky. We gave them space. <laughs> From the outset, the Bond films have been visually stunning thanks in large part to the contributions of talented artists like Ken Adam. Ken, I think, honestly contributed an incredible amount of the success of, of Bond, an incredible amount. He really s stamped a style on the Bond films right from the onset. I'm not so sure that there's a long list or even a short list of people who could have created what Ken created. I just really wish he'd ever, he'd won um, an Academy Award for it. So I think it really put um, design in this country on the map. Beautiful sets, great eye. If I have any claim to fame, I suppose I've shot on the three biggest sets ever built for, for motion pictures. 
and I can add a thanks for that. Mm -hmm.